after we're going alive. Are we alive? I feel alive. Am I alive? Somebody speak to me. Are we there? Hey, everybody. It's Mike Myers. Hey. I think I'm on. Can, can y'all hear me out there? Somebody text me in. My phone is going absolutely bonkers right now. I ha okay, cool. Outstanding. I'm happy. All right. So uh, let's get started here. First of all, welcome to the Mike Myers live stream. Ask me anything. The goal of this live stream is to provide those of us who are somewhat isolated by the coronavirus an opportunity to work on our CompTIA certifications, in particular uh, IT fundamentals, A+, Net+, and Security+, but we can certainly go beyond that on an as-needed basis. Um, this live stream takes place every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time, and it goes for two hours or until the questions run out. So it's really up to you. This is a Ask Mike Anything. So this is driven by you asking me questions, and all you have to do is enter your questions uh, into the live chat window. Also, if you have questions that you think might be a little bit more complicated, just email them to me. So just send them to either one of those email addresses. Please don't send them to both. I'm getting a lot of people doing that. And uh, just pick one or the other. Each one works equally well. And just uh, ask me your question there if you'd like. Uh, in particular, if the question's gonna take a little bit more time, if I have to develop anything, uh, then this is certainly the way to go. Um, but other than that, uh, the goal of this is to, for you guys to ask me questions. Now, just because you are kind enough to show up, we are offering a great deal today. In fact, it's a better deal than usual. Uh, this time it is 60% off. So I'm gonna count on my buddy, Scott Jernigan, to post this deal up. Let me, there's a code. Uh, I don't wanna be a liar, let me get it just right. 60% discount for all all of our practice questions and all of our total sims, the simu simulation questions. Uh, this does not include video or bundles. So this is just practice questions, okay? So all you have to do is contact Kathy Y at totalsim.com for specials on the video bundles. And this is already all posted up somewhere. And the code, this, uh, this code is MM Live Fireworks. That's all one thing. M M L I V E Fireworks. And that's 60% uh, off. So for practice questions, that's even better than our usual 50% off deal. And I'm assuming this will last all week. And fire, oh, I forgot it's the 4th of July coming up. I was not sure what all the fireworks stuff was. Okay, so. Yes, Matt H., there is quite a, uh, a discount today. All right, so Mr. Ruby, you wanted to talk about radius and tachycus. So the questions on the CompTIA exams are extremely rudimentary, but I can mention them. Uh, radius and tachycus plus. I'm just sketching these down so I won't forget them. And basics for hashes and hashing, and what is it used for? You know what? I'm thinking I might want to just do one of these. I mean, I'll, I'll get them both, but I might save one of these for uh, Wednesday. Because we do have some interesting stuff I get covered today. Uh, today we're going to be covering uh, where we had picked up on Friday. We had started talking about NTFS permissions, but the questions were really more of a NTFS permissions in an active directory environment. And I'm gambling that a lot of you guys haven't ever even seen a Windows server. So I've got one up and cooking, and uh, we're gonna talk about that. And I'll actually, so we're gonna do a little bit more in NTFS, a little bit of an overview on uh, Windows Server, and what does that mean, you know, what is a domain, what is an Active Directory domain. Uh, so if that's old stuff for you, you might wanna turn down your hearing aid, but I got a feeling that a lot of you guys have never seen a Windows Server up and running. So we will do exactly that. Okay, I'm gonna have <laughs> this just in. 
junk mail. I need to get my notifications fixed. Uh, Sven has a hard question. Where is your hard question? I have an application that uses offsite SQL Server to store order data. Is there a way I can copy the data from that server to a local server so my application works offline? Uh, I'm not a SQL Server person. Uh, I absolutely guarantee that uh, you can do that. Uh, it's just SQL Server, right? So, you know, you can do a full blown. Uh, query on that to pull all the data, generate a new table locally. Um, my question to you, Sven, is that if your application is using an off-site SQL server, are you comfortable enough to go into the application and reconfigure it so it will query the server? Is this running any of this old OBDC stuff or anything like that? Um, the answer to your question, though, is yes, you can. I mean, that, that's the easy one. And then uh, also, uh, I'm, I'm not totally against SQL Server, but there's a lot of, SQL Server costs money, right? Uh, there's other ways to do it. Okay, uh, Morton, that's, so that's all the quick answer I can give you, Sven, I'm sorry. I'd have to know more about like, how does this application query the SQL Server would be like a, a big one right there. What kind of phone do I have? This is a Galaxy Fold. So it's got the foldable screen, very cool. Uh, I've had it now for about four months, five months, works great. I'm completely sold on foldable screens. And I like the fact that it's small, but I can bring it up. It's like I'm watching YouTube videos at night or something like that, it, uh, it works real well. Uh, robust, uh, it came with a cover for it. That's all I've used, just all 100% stock. Uh, Battery will run, if I'm careful, I can go two days. Uh, I'd rather not do that, um, but it's, it's great. The camera is outstanding, it, uh, absolutely incredible camera, uh, great videos, um, and I've been real, real happy with it, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, so over the weekend, I actually had a little bit of fun. Thought I'd show you a picture of me having fun. Let's see if I can bring this up for you guys. Why does this do this to me? That's me out on the water. I am floating down the Guadalupe River here in Texas. And it was 90 degrees, so that would be what? In, that'd be like 32 degrees, 33 degrees for you Europeans. Uh, the water temperature was fantastic. And I'm drinking wine out of a glass, out of a can. We don't have glass on the river. You don't want the glass to break and create pollution. So we use aluminum cans. And as you can see, I'm very daintily keeping my finger up because if we're going to be drinking wine out of a can, one should do it with a little class, don't you think? So it was good. I, I enjoyed getting out on the water. Uh, it's, you know, it's easy to keep social distancing that way. It's not like there's a bunch of people. It was actually almost abandoned. So that was kind of nice. I uh, got to see some old friends I hadn't seen for quite a while. Uh, probably blew my diet a little bit. I gained like one pound in a weekend. So back to the grindstone starting this morning. So we're, but we're doing pretty good. Uh, Andrew Hutz, am I going over resumes today? Andrew, I forgot all about that. Andrew, I apologize because I didn't write it on the magic list that helps me remember. I'm going to put that in. Uh, Andrew, I'm gonna, I promise, next Wednesday is resumes, okay? So we're going to do resumes. I think I'll, let me try to tackle hashing today. And, uh, but uh, Andrew, Wednesday is resume day. I guarantee it. I've got it written down on the magic piece of scrap paper. That's my super organization. I apologize. I completely forgot about that. And uh, so... Uh, resumes, and we'll do AAA, that's Radius and Takakis. Um, so you guys want to do, uh, so for, I guess, uh,
Okay, I'm just reading, guys. All right, let's take a minute and talk about hashes, okay? So a hash is a very interesting little bit of mathematical magic that we can put onto any string of text. The end result of a hash is going to be a fixed length result. So there's different kinds of hashes out there. Uh, there's MD5 hashes, there's SHA-256, there's SHA-512. And for each one of these types of hashes, the end is always fixed length. So, so hash is not an encryption. You think about a hash as kind of like doing division on a number over and over again, except you're just kind of doing the division on the remainder part of the number, and you just keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again, and you get this end result called a hash. So hashes are not encryption, but what a hash can do is it can let me know uh, the integrity of something. So, uh, for example, let's uh, use one type of hash called a SHA-256. Uh, in fact, why don't we fire one up real quick? I'm going to find an a online hash calculator. Uh, but I, but I, there's thousands of these online. I'm just trying to pick one quick here. Mm -hmm. Okay, this will work. All right, let me bring this up so you guys can see this. Okay, so... It's really... Uh, all right, so this particular I went to, this is called toolsfornoobs.com, online tool. There, there's a hundred of these guys, okay? So what you do is you type in any kind of binary value. It's, this will be converted, in, uh, so it's a, uh, just a string of text. So I'm typing in the word text. I'm going to pick the type of... Uh, it's interesting it doesn't show up on your screen because I can see it. So I'm going to select SHA-256. You can see it says there, and I'm going to hash it. And then the result. So here's the result right here. So that's a 256-bit long hash. Now, I'm going to, let's do this again, except now I'm going to type in uh, texts. Just adding the letter S to the end of this. I'm going to do the same uh, hash. Now I want you to watch this when I click that hash this button. Watch. There you go. So you can see that the number is very, very different. What makes hashes interesting is that if I take some string, whatever that string is, here I'm just putting together a few letters, right? Text or texts. Right? And then I hash it. Uh, but that, it can be, it's any binary string, so I can hash uh, a password. I could hash a certificate. Uh, I can hash all of these different things, and then you can do the same hash, and if we come up with the same hash value, we have the same thing. Do you get that? So one of the best examples is passwords. Um, you don't store passwords on computers. Let's keep it simple, like, uh, uh, like we're doing uh, like in a Linux environment where I'm just trying to log into a Linux system. The passwords aren't stored as passwords, they're stored as hashes. So what happens is when you first create a password on a Linux box, it stores the hash. Now it actually does more than that, but let's just keep it simple for right now. It stores the hash value. So there's actually a file that's got your username and then a hash value of your password. Now nobody, you can't reverse a hash. You got it? Hashes cannot be reversed. It is impossible, it cannot be done. They are a one-way function. However, the next time I log in, it's going to ask for my password. And what I'm going to do is when I enter a password into it, then the system will then hash it and compare the hashes. And if the hashes are the same, I've logged in. You got the idea? Uh, we can use uh, hashes for what's known as message authentication. Uh, and this is almost any kind of message. And I'm not even talking like email. You could do it with email. But, you know, even if there's two computers 
sending a little chunk of data back and forth, like they're trying to work something out. Uh, they can use the hashes as a way to double check the other person. Uh, you can use a hash as a digital signature where you can take a photograph and then hash the photograph and then that uh, hash of that photograph, if anybody ever wants to see if they have the same photograph, they hash it and the thing comes out the same, therefore it's the same photograph. Uh, so hashing is used all over the place. I mean, it just goes on and on. I'm going to gamble that that gets some of the answer in. What about collisions? We're, out, we're, we're not quite there yet. Karan Singh, do I know the CIA triad? I do. Let me get to that. Also, no two hashes are ever the same. Well, in theory, uh, the idea is that no two hashes should ever be the same. So this one particular hash we're looking at called SHA-256 has a 256-bit hash. So that means there's something like two to the 256-bit different hash values, right? And uh, so that's a good thing. But one of the things we really, really want to avoid is that any two hash values be the same. So the mathematical function that makes hashes go is very carefully done to avoid these. So when two hashes are the same, we call them collisions. And people who like to crack things look and hope for stuff like that because it helps them figure things out. Uh, so MD5, how long is an MD5 hash? So MD5 is one of the older hashes. I don't have all these memorized like I should. I gotta count real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 32 bit? Oh, now you gotta make me look it up. I'm trying to see how long MD5 hashes are much shorter than SHA 256s. I'm trying to count a bunch of hexadecimal values as fast as I can, and I'm not doing a very good job. So I'm heading over to Wikipedia real quick and double check. 128 bit. Okay. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, it's 32 hexadecimal characters or 128 bit. So 128 bit is only half the length of a SHA-256, but the problem is, is there are situations where MD5 hashes have been, well, not necessarily cracked. You can't really crack the hash, but they can generate collisions on purpose and do naughty things. So MD5 hashes are rarely used anymore. SHA-256, SHA-512 are the big common ones. If you're gonna be studying for uh, Net Plus or Security Plus, the big ones you wanna know off the top of your head, and really the big thing that people wanna know is how long are these hashes? Remember, the hashes are always the same length. And that's gonna be MD5, SHA-256, SHA-512. I'm gonna look. One more time, make sure I'm not missing any that you're going to see on exams. Mm -hmm. uh, for Security Plus, there's a type of hash called a ripe EMD that can go from 128 bits to 320 bits. Uh, but again, the questions you're going to be seeing on CompTIA exams, number one, you know, where are, sh where are hashes used? What is a hash? What are some of the names of the common hashes and how long are their digests? So make sure you know that MD5 is 128 bit. Make sure you know that if they say SHA, then the actual it would be SHA 256 or SHA 512. And that's actually the name of the length of the digest. And remember, they're always going to be the same length. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Karan Singh, isn't that for SHA-1? Oh, SHA-1. There's no such thing as SHA-1. I hate that term. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, so uh, one of the, Karan's asked me a question, and that is some of the hashes are weaker, certainly MD5. There's another one that's not even on my list called SHA-1. SHA-1 uh, had a 160-bit uh, digest, so yes. You're right. 
Okay, how does a salted hash differ? Okay, ooh, you guys are asking lots of more complicated questions, but we'll get them. All right, so the problem we have with passwords is when you hash them. It's impossible to look at a hash and be able to determine what the password was from it because, you know, uh, hashing is a one-way function. However, Let's pick a weaker hash, like MD5s. For the last 30 years, people have been pre-calculating the hashes for lots of anticipated passwords. So they'll go ahead and they'll do Mike, and they'll run the MD5 hash for it, then Mike1, then capital M, IK1. You get the idea? And we'll run these hashes for millions to tens of millions of permutations. With MD5, uh, what did I say it was? 128 bits, uh, that's two to the 128th power, which would be like roughly all of the air molecules on Earth, different permutations. You'd think that that would be hard to crack, but the thing is, is that people who crack stuff know that human beings use phrases. Words like Mike or Jenna or network, you get the idea? And they will pre-hash all of these different permutations and you have these massive hash tables. And uh, what they'll do is, uh, this is a little bit old school, but what they'll do is they'll actually go into a system, they'll scoop up the usernames and the hashes for the passwords and just take that hash and compare it against their, what generally you're known as, sometimes you hear the term dictionary attack, but it's really a rainbow table is the more proper term for these massive, you know, terabyte, multiple terabyte databases of nothing but hashes. And they're trying to find your password. And today's rainbow tables are very good. If you have a password that's based on any form of human name or word, I don't care how many numbers and exclamation points and capitalizations you put on it. If it's 10 characters or less, it can probably be cracked within a few hours. Um, so, well, so that's a problem. So we can do some things to that to make our lives a little bit better. Like for example, one of the things we can do with passwords is we can salt them. Salting just adds more characters to a password. So if your password is Timmy, then we could add a salt that's this complicated long thing and then go ahead and hash it so that whenever anybody asks for a password, what we can do is take the password that they've offered, screw the salt onto it, then run the hash, and then if they match, then we know we've got the same thing. Get the idea? So salts add what we call entropy to uh, hashes, and they're very, very good at defeating rainbow tables. Um, there are ways that uh, even go beyond that, which are known as, uh, we call them key stretchers. Uh, PBKY2, I, there's different names, Bcrypt, things like that, and basically because people are terrible at creating robust passwords in many different situations. In this one, I've just been talking about using like a Linux box that's saving passwords for user logins, but there's a million, anytime a password, a username and a password is used, you have these types of options, okay? So don't think it's like just for Linux machines. They, you know, Windows machines do it. Uh, AAA radius servers do it. There's, it's used all over the place. And so these key stretchers, uh, not only do they provide a salt, but that they do their own little mechanisms. And the whole goal of all these things is just to make hashes that people won't be able to then crack. So how did we do here? I'm just making sure. PVP boy, I have got nothing from anybody in the UK about jobs. It is uh, very frustrating. Uh, I didn't make any calls last week, but I could try calling again, but I just don't have a lot of resources. So, you know, one of the things I might actually count on you guys 
to help me out a little bit in terms of pointing me to like, do your schools provide jobs here in the United States? Most tech schools have very robust job placement programs. In fact, that's often how they survive is, uh, you know, the schools with good job placement survive and the ones that don't have, they don't do well at all. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe you guys can give me some insight on this. Uh, perhaps we could, you know, talk about your experience in the UK, you know, what schools you're attending, how does this all fit together? Uh, send me an email and let's see if we can start putting this together on our own. Okay, do I know the CIA triad, Karan Singh? Karan, you are asking questions all over the place, which is fine. Uh, so CIA TRED stands for Confidentiality, uh, Integrity, and is it accountability? I don't know the CIA, forget it. CIA of Security, I forget what the A stands for. Let me guess. Oh yeah, that's right. Availability. Okay. So yes. Karen Singh, I, I uh, forgot that the A stood for availability. So I'm going to assume that you have more questions there. Network Mage, I believe it's a birthday attack compromise. Uh, I mean, that's one thing. I really just was looking more for dictionary attack kind of stuff. Karen Singh, what do you want to use it for? Hashes equal integrity. Sure. Okay. I, I, Karen, you're, you're, because of the delay between me and you, I'm not quite sure how I can help you out there. It sounds like you're kind of answering stuff. So guys, when you're talking to each other, it's extremely helpful to me if you do the at sign and whoever you're talking to. Uh, otherwise, if I don't see anything, I'm assuming you're talking to me. Jenna Griffin Greeley, it is a Windows 10 computer. It is a Windows 10 computer. So now I gotta scroll way up and find the other part of this. Yeah, sorry guys, again, it's uh, Jenna, I don't see any more than just that one statement. So I'm gonna, Sven, do a, do a hash with a pen and paper? No, uh, I will not. It's a pain in the rear end. I did it once to satisfy myself 20 some odd years ago. Uh, it's, it's awful. Okay, here we go. Network mate. Question, what is process in the HTT process? Where does hashing come into the digital certificate process? Uh, in a few places. Um, one of the first things we do, let me see if I can actually pull up the certificate real quick and show you. Uh, no, that's not going to do that. I, by wacky coincidence, I happen to have a certificate on. Oh, I know what happened here. This is a weird certificate. It's not going to be good. All right, bear with me. Let me pull up a certificate and we can talk about uh, how hashes come into play with digital. One of the places where it comes into play, but uh, uh, it's been a while since I've done this. Uh, actually, I think I could just get it right here, couldn't I? <laughs> I'm just finding a certificate for us to play with. Oh, no. Uh, okay be a little ugly, but we can make this work. So all I've done is I just, by coincidence, when I was looking up what was the CIA triad of security, because I forgot that A stood for availability, I always want to say accounting. Uh, I'm on a secure web page, so I just went ahead and right-clicked on the lock and pulled up the certificate for the web page I'm on. So let's take a look at that together. All right, all right so what's going to happen is that you're going to have a number of different places where hashes come into play. Like for example, on, on this certificate, we have what's known as a fingerprint, which is basically, this is the hash of the certificate itself. 
and it's in two different forms. And there should be another one in here somewhere. So I'm going to avoid that. We should probably do a certificates class, huh? Certificates are amazing. Anyway, let, let's just let's get to the answer, which was how do hashes come into play with certificates? In a lot of different ways, and I'm just going to show you one. What you saw there was the fingerprint, all right? And that is the actual hash of the certificate itself. So when people are downloading a, a certificate or whatever it is, they can run their own hash on it using whatever values are within there and should come up with the same one. That way they're sure nobody's manipulated a certificate. So that would be one place where a hash would be used on certificates. Hash is also used in asymmetric, oh boy, I don't remember exactly how it's used. In a TLS handshake, at one point, as they're trying to make the secure connection using that, it's a, they hash a nonce? I'm, I'm lying to you. I don't, I, do, I don't remember. I don't have the TLS four-way handshake memorized like I used to. Uh, so there's places within the actual handshake that's really after the certificates. At this point, they're just negotiating where data is being passed back and forth via hashes and compared to something that somebody else already knows. Sven, does one rainbow table generally support multiple languages? No, they usually, they tend to be language specific. At least the good ones that people use to actually crack stuff. Um, I'm sure there are simple, like, simple eight character ones um, that would handle that. But again, even in those, you're talking about a, I forget what the proper term is here, the uh, English character set, Roman letters, numbers, whatever it might be. Si hey, it's Pike. How's it going, man? Look at all, you guys know all this stuff. Everybody's typing in availability for me from earlier. Thank you. All right. I also need to warn you guys, uh, last week my scroller just stopped working. And all of a sudden I couldn't see questions, so I'm going real, real quick. Oh, Pikey, you failed the 1002. Sorry, man. Listen, don't panic about failing exams. These are not college entrance exams. I fail probably one third of all the cert certification uh, tests I've ever taken. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's a pain in the butt, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, if I were you, Pika, I would be just as quick as I can, re-up and study a little bit more. Uh, the worldwide first pat, the worldwide pass rate for CompTIA A plus exams on the first try is only 40%. So yes, it's unfortunate. I'm, I know you've, you're probably a little frustrated right now, but it's not a big deal. You just reset and go take it again, and then you're fine. Nobody cares how many times you took an exam. I know it costs money, but that's really the only downside. So sorry about that, man. Uh, okay, so Jenna has a question. I built my husband a computer. That's nice. And the Wi-Fi goes in and out. It will work when I use the Ethernet cord from the desktop to the router. It's an Intel. All right. Well, Jenna, I'm going to bet dollars to donuts that going in and out has very little to do with your setup itself. Uh, when I start to see things where the Wi-Fi is going in and out, I tend to uh, blame the wireless access point. You're probably in an area of weak signal. Um, that, that would be the first thing I'd be looking at. Uh, are, are you in a dead zone? Uh, can you uh, get the computer physically closer? 
Uh, I know a lot of people will buy high gain antennas. I don't like doing that. Uh, if you're, you need to have your wireless access point placed in such a way wherever I can get to it. So my first big test would be, is, it, is, is your wireless access point in a good spot? Second thing I'm gonna be doing is saying, are there other SSIDs in the area that could be causing conflict? Especially if you're going in and out, a lot of times somebody else is dumped on your channel and you're having problems that way. Can you move out of that channel? Especially if you're on the five gigahertz band, like if you're running 802.11ac, 802.11n, 802.11ax, you know, go buy a new Intel card that's one of the more you know, five gigahertz bands, that tends to be a big plus. While we're talking about that, I don't know what kind of wireless access point you have. Is it an old 802.11g you know, from 1997? Maybe it's time to, or 2007? Maybe it's time to consider getting a new WAP. And there's some really good deals out there on WAPs. The other thing you might want to consider if you have dead space is taking a look at some of the uh, wonderful mesh router systems that are, uh, mesh wireless systems that are out there today. That would be the other thing to look at. Uh, I would also probably want to be hanging out with you. Like when the signal's good, is it good? And then suddenly it's bad. I would start looking for interference issues. Uh, microwave ovens, baby monitors, uh, ham radios, uh, it, not because of the radio, it's the, inter, it's the electronics within them. There's a lot of stuff that creates interference. Uh, my first tool I'm going to turn to is there's so many good Wi-Fi testers out there. I usually use another phone. Let's see if I got anything on here. I have a separate phone for testing wireless networks. Gosh, there's so many out there. I don't even worry about naming one. Let's see what comes up quickly if I do a... This is the Android. If you, if you got a Mac, you got an Apple, sorry. Uh, Wi-Fi Man from Ubiquity. W-I-F-I Man. Can you guys see that? That's a pretty good one. Ubiquity is a good company too. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully you're able to see that. That's what I'm going to be testing. I, I, it's very rare for a system itself to drop a good Wi-Fi signal. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. You might want to consider drivers, but I, I honestly, I would really be looking at the WAP side of that issue hard. The last word, are unidirectional antennas still used to connect two buildings? Uh, are, okay, if you were paying me to connect two buildings, I'm gonna run a piece of conduit and I'm gonna run fiber optic cabling, okay? So when you say a question like that, it says, are they used? Sure, I got a buddy who has a boathouse down by the lake. He's not gonna spend, you know, $3,500 to get you know, fiber run down there. He just wants something so he can check his navigation and the weather before he takes a sailboat out. And in that case, yeah, because that's only going to set me back for like really good unidirectional antennas, probably about 200 bucks each. Uh, all the plumbing to get it connected to whatever routing and weather stripping and all that. I mean, it would be 500 bucks. So it's a very inexpensive way to connect two things. Is it as good as fiber? Never. In any serious campus installation, you will never use wireless to connect buildings, okay? Now, if you run into a question on a CompTIA exam that talks about that, well, then respond with that. Uh, you know, CompTIA has lots of questions where they're not showing you the ultimate right way to do stuff. They're just telling you what it is. Deal with it. So, uh, yes, in the real world, like if I had a campus, all my interconnections between all the buildings would be fiber optic. It always has been for over 30 years. That's the only way I would do it. Wireless is a inexpensive and quick way to do stuff when you don't have time to dig a trench and lay conduit and pull fiber cable. But my, the answer to the last word is fiber optic's better.
Yeah, uh, uh, Pika, I don't get that many people talking to me on Steam. So, yeah, it's easy to remember you. Jenna Griffin Bailey, it says default gateway unavailable. Well, that even reinforces it more. Uh, default gateway unavailable. Man, Jenna, this is a, this is a tricky one. Uh, so, Jenna, uh, you're sitting on that machine. Uh, can you do an IP config release renew? Does it come back up? Uh, it just, it's still, look, it sounds like weak signal, Jenna. You got to have to get away from the keyboard and head over to the WAP and start jacking with stuff. The, these little statements in a weak signal with wireless, you get all kinds of weird errors. It's a bad signal. I mean, if you, oh, you have a Windows, that's where you said you have a Windows machine. So, uh, so Windows doesn't do a very good job of showing you your signal strength, not that I'm aware of. So again, you know, using like Wi-Fi Man or something like that to be able to just, you know, stand right over the computer and say, oh, I've barely got any signal, you know, or here is another SSID that's stomping all over me. Um, you'd be surprised sometimes it's, or do you have a laptop laying around or, you, or when your phones connect, are they dropping in and out? You know, there's, this is a very, very complicated question you're asking me and unfortunately, it would take a lot of individual questions. Almost rather have you on the phone. Sven, at my company, they use antennas to connect warehouses. It works. I'm just saying fiber optics better. Uh, there, Sven, there are ISPs in rural areas. There are ISPs in rural areas here in the United States that also use 802.11. In fact, where I was floating in the river, what we call the Texas Hill Country, is famous for using 802.11 and they have towers that are covered in directional antennas. But it's still not the better way to go. It's cheaper. PVP boy, what are the laws on packet sniffing public networks or other types of tools? Uh, those laws change uh, depending on what country you're in. Uh, I believe I'm not an attorney, uh, so I'm not going to try to answer that for you. Passive sniffing in the United States is legal. Anything that is where you're, you're grabbing wireless data and you're bringing it into your computer, you can do anything you want with it. You can crack it. You can, you know, pull the passwords. In the United States where you get in trouble is that after you crack this and then you use those and you ag aggressively try to hurt somebody, you try to hack something. Do you understand? So just pulling in signals and looking at them, even if you manipulate them, that's legal. And in fact, it's, there's no way to enforce them for you to not do that. But where you get in trouble in the United States is then when you take that information, let's say you find a password or a, a, you crack a wireless network and you get the, that private shared key. And then if you were to then use that private shared key, to go into that wireless network, that's where it becomes illegal. Oh, Pike, I, I almost uninstalled Steam. I've just been getting so busy lately, but keep on top of me, man. Sam David. Hey, Mike, currently studying for the A+. Whoops. Currently studying for, what's your advice on getting IT experience? <laughs> I work dig, freelance digital marketing, graphic design. I want to switch careers into information technology. All right, well, Sam, David, uh, you know, we ran into this question like three weeks ago with a bunch of folks from the UK. What I can tell you is what we do here in the United States. Uh, number one, there's plenty of entry level positions, especially right now with the COVID virus. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of hiring for re work from home kind of folks. Uh, going to the classic websites uh, is uh, the I, I, gorilla.com. I forget all the names anymore. Uh, there, there are plenty of openings there. Here in the United States, we use Craigslist a lot for, especially for entry level jobs. Uh, it's, there's nothing wrong in just going door to door. Find the little mom and pop computer companies. Find uh, here in the United States. Best Buy, uh, Micro Center, all these guys. And, and you have to get up. Go put on a mask, 
and start handing people resumes. They probably won't accept it and they'll say, here, submit a resume here, whatever it is. You get out there and you do it. Uh, so that, there, there's plenty of folks who do it like that. Uh, you should be submitting hundreds of resumes. In terms of experience, you have a lot of experience. You've been working on, you said in graphic design, I bet you've been doing all kinds of uh, IT stuff with graphics design. You've been configuring systems. You've been working with this. Uh, there's charity work out there that will take just about anybody who's willing to give them some help. You put, especially when you're entry level, you put that stuff on a resume to show that you have been doing some IT. And uh, w when you see entry level and it says one year experience required, that's not entry level. They put one year of experience in there because they don't want, they, they want to chase away all the wussy people, okay? And you kick the door in and you apply for those jobs. And if somebody in an interview says, well, you don't have a year experience, you go, yeah, I do. See this charity work? See, I've been doing all this design stuff. I've been building my own systems on my own. Give me a technical interview and then, you know, let me show you that I do have what you know. Uh, most people fire themselves. It, my, it's an old story. I, I, you'd see a pretty girl like in high school and nobody would want to go ask her on a date. I'd ask her on a date because all the other guys, they'd be like, oh, I'm, she's too good for me. I was like, you know what? I'm going to let her make that decision. I'm going to still going to ask. And it's the same way with jobs. Don't assume that you don't have, I mean, if you're missing like two thirds of the requirements and yeah, that's probably not a good job. But a lot of times if, you, if there's just a couple of things on the resume that you can't cover, go for the job. Let them choose that you're not right. I just see people go through, oh, that's no good. I can't do that. That's no good. I can't do, stop. Apply for the damn jobs. It just, it's very, very, I'm sorry if I get uh, loud there. I get very frustrated. So many people, and I'm not saying this is you at all. Of course not. But I have thousands of people in, in the last few decades, and they're like, I can't find a job. And I'm like, okay, well, call me on the phone. Talk to me. And then, then you start hearing it. Oh, well, I don't want to do that. Well, I can't move. Uh, I have to live with my mom. Uh, I'm not qualified for that. This requires lifting. I'm not sure if my car's good enough. I don't like that neighborhood. Yeah, I just... Eighty, eighty-five percent of the people, when we end up talking on the phone because they're having trouble, I find that they are so self-limiting in their job because they don't have the chutzpah to get out there and hustle or they're, or, or they're lazy or they won't get in the bus and throw some resumes down to a few people. They won't go work in a charity just to get some kind of experience. They won't sit here and talk about, you know, fixing their mom's computers or their dad's or their uncle or their bartender or, the, or their plumber's helper's cousin's nephew. Because you can, everybody has a computer. Everybody needs help. You get out there and you get it. Now, I know I'm here in Texas in the United States and everything's yeehaw around here. And uh, I'm sure things are probably different uh, in the EU and the UK. I know you guys are a little bit more mellow than we are. Uh, but I love people who hustle. And as a guy who's hired a lot of folks over the years, I would much rather hire somebody with enthusiasm, with energy, with drive, than somebody who may not, who has every single criteria. And I've done it. I've hired instructors. This is a true story. I was hiring for an instructor. This is a long time ago. And the, I had two persons and they were, in terms of uh, experience and skills, they were identical. They were identical. And I, I couldn't make a decision. I couldn't afford to hire them both. So I asked these two instructors this one question. You ready? In the original Star Trek, in the episode where the hippies took over the Enterprise, there was this one hippie who kept singing this song all the time. In fact, one time he was even jamming with Spock. What's the name of the song? 
Well, of course, both of them knew the name of the song. It's going down to Eden, but only one person could sing it all the way through. And I hired that person. Scott, that was Richard Smith. And he worked for me for a number of years. Now he's rich and gone. But it, 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 it can come down to such small things sometimes. So the bottom line is, is that uh, getting out there, you, uh, use the three-foot rule. Anybody who is within three feet of you, you ask them if they can get a job. You see somebody walking out of a business you like, you're like, hey, do you know where the HR department is? I mean, th that's what it takes sometimes. Uh, I, I don't think most people have to go to that extreme. I think most people find themselves successfully getting jobs far easier than that. But I mean, th these are just a few things to consider. You know, the average person looking for an entry-level IT job, in my experience, sends out over 100 resumes and gets one or two offers. You, know, you send out three or four resumes, I didn't get any offers. It's tough. Get back out there, man. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Brandon, we're all imposters. Everybody gets imposter syndrome. Me sitting here in front of you guys trying to do this. And uh, who was asking me a question already? I was like, I don't remember anything about it. I forgot what it was. It was an answer I, question I managed to very clear. Yeah, we're all faking it till we make it, brother. There's no exception to that. As, okay, uh, one more for you, Pika. Well, you can ask all the questions you want. I just really would like to get to NTFS, though, today. Um, my goal is to be an ethical hacker. I always wonder why people want to do that. You know, like white hat hacking or vulnerability assessment, to me, is one of the most boring jobs on earth. But OK, whatever. Uh, when I have my search for A plus, net plus, net or plus, security plus, is it possible for me to get some entry hacking job? Yeah, sometimes. So, Pikey, usually what you're going to have to be looking for is there are entry-level jobs like that, but they're going to be guys who are going to be sitting in front of a monitor from midnight till 8 in the morning, these 24-7 monitoring services. Um, there's like 30 or 40 of them all over the world. Most of them work through AWS uh, AW, or any of the cloud providers. Uh, that's one good way to go. The little mom and pops are not going to hire you. They, they just... It's not going to happen. Uh, also, the other way most security people get their jobs is they start as techs, then they show a little bit of security skill, and they go there. The whole other way to get into IT security, people always should remember this, is get yourself a four-year degree. It doesn't have to be in IT. It could be in history. But with that four-year degree, that brings you into the whole world of governance and management. And I know lots of people with liberal arts degrees and things like that who just happened to get in the ground floor of a newer company that was looking for people and now they're security architects or you know stuff like that and uh, they're doing real well so there are entry-level jobs for somebody who just wants to go straight into security but they're they're rare they're not real common most security guys especially if it's a security guy in a particular company they start as a tech and then from that tech world, they move into security. And Pike, on one of these days, you're gonna to have to tell me, why do you wanna be a hacker? See, here's a problem. People go, oh, I'm gonna be a hacker. Here, here's every hacker in every movie I've ever seen. You ready? Okay, we need you to crack this code. Shoot. Darn it. Okay, I'm in. I mean, it's so unrealistic. I mean, you sit here trying to download a big old rainbow table and you don't have enough hard drive space and it's two in the morning you know and you've got to get this report to the customer by 8 a.m and you're not having any luck and nmap's lying to you and i don't know i don't think there's nearly that much glamour you want to get in the glamorous part of security get a four-year degree go get your like your cissp and you know hang around with those people who couldn't even configure a router if they wanted to, but boy, they could talk about business impact analysis, and those are the people who make the big money. Would it be better to do bug bounties and go for a CEH? 
Pika, if you're at a point where your skill set is good enough that you could actually go for bug bounties, uh, salute. Um, yeah. Uh, going for CEH is always a good idea. In fact, that was one of the things I wanted to tell you guys. I'm talking to EC Council right now. We're going to have a talk next week. But after that, I'm going to get, I'm, try, I'm trying to get this person from EC Council to be in this live stream. And we're actually have a conversation where you guys can ask some of these harder hitting questions like this. Uh, I'll be very interested. These are the people who create, who, who administer the certified ethical hacking certification. And they're talking to me because they want to talk to you, right? Because once you get passed through my stuff, then CEH is one of, one of many ways you can go. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting. Man, as soon as I can verify that, I got to talk to them on July 6th to confirm what we're going to talk about. And then assuming they say yes, because I'm going to warn them that you guys are going to be asking, like, where do I get jobs? You know, wh what's the pathway? How does cert certification really come into play for employers and stuff like that? And I think it would be fascinating to hear somebody from EC Council talk about this. So fingers crossed. Yes, thank you, the last word. There you go. Dave L., the only way I can configure my home router is through a graphical interface. Uh, okay, well, that's how most of us configure our home routers, Dave. That's all right. Is there a way to configure it through a terminal from my device? It depends on the router. I would probably say that three quarters of the home routers that are out there, they do not have a command line interface where you can SSH or Telnet or whatever into it. Uh, but the moment you start going to a more serious router, uh, Cisco, I guarantee you could do that. Juniper, I guarantee you could do that. Ubiquity, uh, Unify, yes, those all have command line interfaces. And that's a whole other language to learn. So my question to you is, why in the world would you want to go in a command line interface and try to learn a whole new language that you don't know when you're trying to set a static IP address to a graphical user interface that works just great? I go to a command line because the graphic inter... And this isn't just for routers. This could be Windows. This could be Linux. I go to the command line because the graphical user interface either won't do what I need it to do or does it in an inefficient way where a command line can do it better, okay? That's why we still go to a command line. If I can get to a, a GUI that works properly for my router or my switch or my Windows system or my Samsung folder, I'm not going to go to a command line. I'm going to stay in the GUI, get done what I need to get done. If the GUI does not provide you a way to do something, or if the GUI does it in an inefficient way, that's when you go to a command line. But otherwise, I like graphical user interfaces. All right, Jenna, looks like maybe Tolowit gave you some information with those at signs. And again, thank you guys for doing that. It just speeds things up. I'm already so behind uh, that, that, that helps. There you go. See, even Greg Davis agrees with me. Attitude and work ethic. Uh, as a Cameron, Hollywood makes hacking believable. Uh, hacking happens. Uh, you know, I used to do a lot of work with the FBI here in the United States, and you know, there's this cartoon that I saw up on a guy's desk. It said, "These." These hackers have put in this pass, this thing. How can we hack it? We're going to need a $10 million computer. And the other FBI said, just goes, nah, just hit him over the head with this $5 wrench. <laughs> You'd be surprised in, in so many situations in pen testing, vulnerability assessment, law enforcement. The last thing you ever want to do is get stuck trying to crack passwords or, 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 you know, personal shared keys, you know, there's, you use social engineering, get, have people give you their passwords, you know, there, there's, 
I have probably aggressively cracked certainly less than 100 passwords in my entire, God, has it been 40 years? Almost 40 year career. Less than 100, probably closer to 50 times. It's just not, it's, 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 it's a statement of failure when you're reduced to trying to crack passwords. Do what the cool kids do. Be clever and have people just give you those answers. What's my favorite IT job? Teaching. <laughs> I like to teach. I think I got a gift for it. I, you know, I'm, I'm Gabby. You know, so yeah, teaching. Uh, Matt, uh, am I involved in any crypto mining? I was. I tried it a couple of times. Uh, I was hanging out with some guys who had basically converted their house. They had a bunch of ASICs. They had started with using the graphics cards and then moved out of that pretty quick. And they're doing okay. Uh, Zods, I missed a question of yours. Uh, I'm sorry. You guys are asking a lot of questions today, which is good, but I'm missing them. Azad, second question. I upgraded to Xeon X5460. Yeah, it's good old, but it's a good one. Tried to run Win 10, 8.1 to really sluggish, but ran Ubuntu. So it runs slow with Windows, but fast with other stuff. Azad, I don't have any clue. I mean, I could help you Google it. Here. X E O N is 5460. Windows runs slow. Uh, so I'm just on micro answers.microsoft.com and part of the Win 10 specification says it. It's not supposed to run on a Xeon. <laughs> How's that? I'm just reading. Oh my goodness, this goes on and on. There's a lot of people having problems trying to run Windows 8, 8.1 or 10 on older Xeon processors. So it just, I just hit one web page. And all I did is I typed in, what did I type in? Xeon 5460 Windows runs slow and found tons of stuff. Here's a Reddit page. A guy's trying to build on a 5460. Oh, that got moved over to tech support. So it looks like it's a bad idea. All right, let's go back to the questions. Just scrolling through the questions here, guys. Scrolling. Oh, goodness sakes. Blowtorch to the knee. There you go. Sven, what can a PowerShell script do that a batch script cannot do? Well, PowerShell is many, many times more powerful than the old school batch files. Uh, there are, well, well, I'll give you a great example. Uh, you can directly access the registry through PowerShell scripts. So, you, know, you have to have the right permissions, but I can write you a PowerShell script that will directly edit the registry anywhere you want. You can't do that in a batch file. Uh, I can get you a PowerShell script that will allow me to 
create partitions. Uh, I have a PowerShell script that will allow me to add local users. Um, I have PowerShell scripts that can light up log files and run baselines. Uh, you need to uh, do a Google search for Microsoft PowerShell script library and just go nuts. Microsoft has bazillions of pre-made PowerShell scripts for everything. I've never written a PowerShell script from scratch. I think I did like the classic Hello World when I was first playing with it years ago, but I've never written my own PowerShell script from a blank screen. I always go to the Microsoft libraries, find something that's pretty close to what I want it to do because it's there, I guarantee it, and uh, then tweak it up however I need to to then be able to do what I need. So, yeah, I am not a programmer, guys, not even close. Tolowit, you are Army Counterintelligence? Cool. Uh, yes, Sam David, it's pounding the pavement, man. Afkid Patel, are there exactly 90 multiple choice questions and simulations in the A+. Uh, there's 90 questions. Uh, the number of simulations or performance-based questions varies. It could be as few as zero. I've heard people say they get zero. I've never seen that. Usually two, three, four performance-based questions and the rest are multiple choice. Uh, S. Sumter, any ideas, mouse, for someone who has a hard time using their arms and hands? Uh, so, for special needs folks, there's all kinds of devices. So my first question would be, is, is the mouse the right tool for them? Um, I've known a lot of folks, I, I don't know anybody with muscular dystrophy who's a tech, uh, but I know a lot of folks who have, uh, you know, control issues. I have a friend who has cerebral palsy, and uh, she uses a uh, trackball. That's what works for her. So I guess the big, uh, I've seen folks use joysticks. Uh, so my big question to you uh, with this person is you'd have to have some experimentation in terms of, you know, what works best for their motion. Uh, you might, you know, obviously you want to talk to them uh, uh, and you're probably going to have to be ready for experiment. Uh, I find for a lot of people with special needs that a mouse is often probably one of the trickier things because there's no absolute point to a mouse, right? You can just pick it up and stuff like that. I would ask them, and keep in mind that there's a lot of pointing devices out there. Touch screens are also a big one too. So just stuff you might want to consider. And here in the States, I mean, I can go anywhere to get that stuff. Uh, also keep in mind that, you know, Microsoft comes with some great tools uh, for people with special needs too. You know, working with filter keys or sticky keys and stuff like that are wonderful. Uh, in fact, I think all tech should at least play with them once so you get used to the features and understand how they work. Akka Patel, we don't know how many, uh, we don't, you, no one will know. You, may, you might have zero. You'll probably have two or three. I've heard people say that they ended up getting six. It, is, it varies and changes by every different person who takes the exam. Pawan, Pawan, what do you recommend? CCNA or MCSA route? Do you like Cisco better than Microsoft? I mean, do you want to be messing with routers? Configuring switches, setting up VLANs. You want to be, you know, working with uh, configuring Active Directory. You want to be setting up users. You want to be, you know, dealing with software installations, you know, system upgradings in the uh, enterprise environment. Then go Microsoft. It's two totally different things. It's, you know, the problem with CompTIA is once you get past the Security Plus you really start to have to make decisions of where, where is your passion. And hopefully by the time you've done Security Plus, you at least have some ideas of what's out there and, you know, and what's taking place. 
Uh, so what sounds good? And, and for the other record, you could always change your mind. So go the Microsoft route for a while and you suddenly find yourself doing network administration and you know, fixing people's passwords or configuring exchange servers or whatever it might be and you don't like it, go back to school and go Cisco. You know, it's not like you're locked into anything. Oh, thank you, Scott Jernigan. Hello, Holly Jackson. I was wondering if you can explain Mac filtering security. I just took it past the CWT100. Good for you, man. And it just said that Mac filtering is not secure. Well, I agree with those guys. Mac filtering is not secure. On CompTIA exams, CompTIA exams seem to think that Mac filtering is the greatest thing ever. Um, let me see what my home router has on it. Where to go? There it is. God, it's three twelve already. Uh, I'm just I'm looking in my home router for uh, any kind of interesting settings for Mac filtering. Ah. That's just firewall there. <laughs> Stand by. I'm working on it, kids. Almost there. I can do Mac filtering without uh, something pretty in front of me, but I'd sure rather have it. I am pretty unhappy with this firewall source destination port. It's just regular old firewall. Okay, well, I don't have it, sorry. So we're just gonna have to do it through interpretive dance. So Mac filtering just means to filter stuff by Mac address. Um, for example, you could um, on a lot of home routers, and any router, but a lot of home routers will have it where you can uh, either whitelist or blacklist MAC addresses. So, and on a good one, it'll sit there, it'll go look on the network, including your wireless, and it'll say, here are the computers that are currently connected to this network. Would you like me to whitelist them? And you say yes. And the only computers that are going to get on that network from there on in are the computers with those MAC addresses. Remember, it could be a wireless MAC address. Works fine, whether it's wireless or wired. You can whitelist it. You can also do a blacklisting that says, let anybody on except these MAC addresses. But there's two big problems. Number one, uh, it's exactly right, is that you can easily spoof MAC addresses. On the wireless networks, these MAC addresses are being transmitted. They can be seen. So it's very easy for me to go into my wireless device and I can uh, turn the power way up far better than the other wireless client. I can punch that MAC address into my device and I can be you. So that's pretty trivial to do. Um, the other big problem with uh, MAC filtering is that it's, it's really uh, administratively intense. What if you add another computer to your network or you add a, another uh, wireless mesh satellite? It's got a MAC address on there. You're going to have to get things updated. Um, black uh, to, uh, uh, to blacklist stuff is really hard. I mean, why are you picking on, what is it, your, your nephew who comes over every day and with his phone or something? You can turn him off. Yeah, I guess you can. But what if the nephew gets a new phone? You know, so there's a lot of administrative to it. So uh, I do not feel that it is a good security tool. And, uh, but if you see any MAC address filtering questions on any CompTIA exam, I want you to think it's a good thing, okay?
Brendan S. What aspect ratio ratios? What aspect ratios for display should we expect on the A plus 1002 exams? VGA, XGA, SVGA, W anything, uh, HD, HD 720, up to 4K. And it's not so much they're expecting to memorize a bunch of resolutions. They expect you to understand, you know, different aspects. You know, what's 4 by 3 versus 16 by 9 versus 16 by 10? You know, um, just know them. And most of the time, I don't, I'm not aware of a lot of questions that actually ask about stuff beyond, you know, at least on the 4 by 3s, you know, it's going to be the old 644, 80, 800, 600, 1024 by uh, 768. But most of the time, they're going to ask you a question where if you just take a moment and do the math, you can calculate it in your head right there. Uh, Haras Khan, how about CCNA versus Network Plus nowadays? Well, to me, they're not the same. I, I don't see them as equivalents, and neither does Cisco, for that matter. Uh, to me, the Network Plus is the most important certification you'll never need. And what I'm saying is that to try to find a job with a Network Plus, good luck. But what Network Plus does for you and why I, I, love, I love that certification, I love teaching it because it's your only chance to get an unbiased understanding of a lot of networking. If you go to Cisco for the first time you learn VLANs, you're going to learn it all Cisco-y. If you go to Microsoft certifications for the first time you learn DNS, you're going to get it all Microsoft-y. It's weird. Network Plus is your last chance to learn about most of our core network technologies without some weird vendor bend to it that confuses things. Horace, if you can take Network Plus, take it. Network Plus will help you if you go Microsoft. It'll help you if you go Cisco. It'll help you if you go wireless. Uh, it'll help you with security, um, which I can't say for those other certs. Sure. El oh, hey, Elaine. Yeah, Elaine, the problem I have with Juniper certs is that I just don't see a lot of people looking at it. In my opinion, if you're going to be getting into hardware, you need to be a Cisco person. And then if you get into, say, Juniper devices, go with that. The only exception to that is if you got really good at some very specific types of hardware, um, you know, some kind of uh, CM, SIEM box or something like that, or proxy servers or something. That would be the only thing. But you're right, Elaine. Uh, there definitely are other ones out there. All right. Man, we really went long on questions. I really want to take a minute. First of all, I want to talk about uh, one of the questions we had was uh, with um, uh, BIA. And the question was, Mike, what is, you guys ready? Hope you got a pen and paper on you. Uh, what is SLE, ARE, and ARO? Okay, guys. There's not a lot of, these are security plus questions and these are, you're going to see them on the security plus exam, all right? You need to know what those three are. This, these are, has to do with what's called business impact analysis, all right? A big part of security is being able to handle, if something goes wrong, what is it going to take for us to fix it? Uh, what type of risks are there out there? What, what do we do with these risks? You know, a lot of risks... We just ignore them, all right? I have no preparation for my business being hit by a meteor, okay? I've chosen to ignore that risk. Uh, but usually what we try to do is mitigate the risk. So a lot of times, if you can use a quantitative assessment on a risk, that's going to be a very, very good thing. Because a quantitative assessment, see, you can use dollars as, or money as a way to make a determination about that. So... When we talk about, um, let's get these down one at a time. You ready? SLE, 
stands for a uh, single loss expectancy. So if, uh, if one of our routers goes down, uh, how, uh, is how much money are we going to lose <clears throat> if a router goes down we're going to have to buy a new router we're going to have to pay somebody to reconfigure it we're going to have to pull the old config files that we keep in backup to bring the router back up so it's going to cost us four thousand dollars if we lose a router it's going to cost us four thousand dollars to fix it okay okay well that's how much it costs to fix a router well then the next thing you need to remember is the uh, annualized rate of occurrence or the ARO, all right? So the ARO is how many times, what are the chances in a year of this router going down? Uh, I could have done this math ahead of time. So let's just say that the chance, we lose a router once every four years, okay? And that's, we just know that from experience. So the ARO on that is going to be, oh, I got to do the math. I can do this. So if the chances of losing, I said once every four years, so annualized, that would be 0.25. Gee, don't make it hard, Mike. So I'm basically every four years anticipating that I'm going to lose a router. So if it's $4,000 and then, uh, so we take the single loss expectancy, which is the cost times the ARO, SLE times the ARO. So 0.25 times $4,000. And then we get the annualized loss expectancy or ALE. Guys, this is a security plus question. Okay. I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, so we take the single loss expectancy, which is a dollar value. You take the annualized uh, rate of occurrence, which is going to be a percentage, a decimal point. Uh, and then you multiply that together and you get the annualized loss expectancy. This is done in risk management when you can. There's a lot of things that happen in risk that aren't really measurable in dollars. So this is what we call a quantitative assessment. And this is a very common thing that's done in industries to help them, you know, determine costs and stuff like that. So SLE times ARO equals ALE. And yeah, I've got to look at it too. I always have to re remind myself how that stuff works. Okay. It's almost 3.30 already. All right. So, thank you, Scott. Yeah, that's about the only formula you'll get on Security Plus is that one that Scott Jernigan just wrote down. All right, you guys ready to do some fun stuff? Because, you know, there's a big part of the uh, Security Plus is all this risk management. I find it a little dull, to be honest with you, because I'm a nerd and I'd rather work on stuff. So with that attitude in mind, let's play. So let me start off. Do we have, okay. So what I want to show you right here is what my setup is. So I have set up, uh, okay. So I've set up this uh, wire, this is a virtual network, okay? And what I've done is on VirtualBox, I've set up a uh, virtual NAT that is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the network ID is 10.0.2 WAC24. I set this up. You guys know you can do all this in VirtualBox. You know VirtualBox is free. Everything that I'm doing right here is free, okay, and fun. Okay, so, so I set up my uh, virtual NAT device, and this is also a DHCP server. So I've set up a Windows server system, and I've created a domain called miketest.local, and the server has the IP address of 10.0.2.10. Come on, come on, come on. Don't 
Don't do this to me right now. Oh, no, it's, no, it's doing fine. Hang on. Oh, uh, you're, you're just seeing a little corner of it. That's, ooh, that made me nervous. So I'm going to log into this guy real quick. All right. So this, I, I, I'm just showing you a corner because everything I'm going to do is in the up, upper left-hand corner. You can see it. So this is Windows Server. If I scroll down, you can see it. You always tell Windows Server is different than regular Windows when you hit the thing. It's very different in terms of the tools that you see. We'll talk about this in a second. So here's that. So that's the Windows Server system I have up and running. Now, also down here at the bottom, I got a copy of Windows 10. This is Windows 10 Enterprise. His IP address uh, came from the DHCP. It's 10.0.2.15. So let's go ahead and log into him real quick. Uh, what was my password? Cool. All right. So this is, you guys, hopefully you've all seen regular Windows 10, just the way we know and love it. Okay. All right. Last week, we were doing NTFS permissions between two systems that were on a work group. If you own a Windows computer, it will either be a member of a work group or it will be a member of a domain. In order for it to be a member of a domain, you have to have a copy of Windows Server, and that copy of Windows Server has to be running as a domain controller, all right? Windows Server is very different than regular Windows 10. I gave you a quick uh, comparison of the two, and you can tell the screens are different. But Windows Server, first of all, the basic core microkernel between Windows 10 and Windows Server is basically the same, all right? The memory management, this, all that kind of stuff. Um, Windows Server can accept more than 20 inputs at a time. Windows 10 uh, Home or Professional or Enterprise can only accept a maximum of 20 people connecting to it. That's why you could never use Windows 10 Professional as a web server because Windows, because they want to, doesn't allow more than 10 people to connect to it. Windows Server has an infinite number of people connecting to it. Windows Server is designed to run really well with like a Xeon processor. <laughs> the Zods, keep that in mind. Um, Windows Server accepts uh, other file systems. You know, it, it, it's, it's very powerful in terms of file systems. But the big thing that uh, Windows Server has is a bunch of tools that just don't exist in the Windows 10 world. It has a DHCP server. This is all built into the operating system. DHCP server, DNS server, uh, file server, all kinds of really, really powerful stuff. Now, you can get a copy of Windows 10 for about 100 bucks. You can get a copy of Windows Server for a couple of thousand dollars, okay? If you want everybody to be able to log into this thing called a domain, you have to take that Windows Server and you have to, we, we used to call the term DC promo, but you have to install the domain controller software onto this system. That domain gets a DNS name. Now, I've set up a domain here called miketest.local. .local means that this little domain is never going to be out on the internet. Oh, now, I'm not saying these individual computers might not have web browsers, and the web browser might go on the internet, but the DNS naming convention is always going to stay inside my network, behind an added router. So that's why we use the term .local, okay? That's to let us know that, all right? But .local is a legitimate DNS thing, okay? So what I want to do is we're going to head over to the, DN, uh, to the, do, the uh, domain controller, and I'm just going to show you a couple of kind of cool things, all right? So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to fire up some interesting tools. So the first thing I'm going to turn on, which is one that everybody likes, and that is, uh, well, I hope this works. We're going to click on Active Directory Domains and Trusts. And I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit so you guys can see that. That's why I have it weird like this, because these screens are so detailed. So what's happened here on this particular screen is it shows that I've created a domain called MikeTest.local. Now, right now, it's pretty simple because there's not much in it. In a, in a Windows domain, like this mic test.local, I can have, well, first of all, it's called a forest. 
So a forest would be like Mike Test dot local and Mike Production dot local and Mike Sales dot local. So these would be different domains, and I'd have different groups of computers connecting to each one of these domains. And then within the domains, I can set up what are called trusts in terms of who trusts what and the type of information that's being passed back and forth. Uh, I can install what are known as sites. So for example, I can put one domain controller in Houston and another domain controller in our Dallas office. And because they're in separate sites, they will be very careful about the amount of data they pass to each other. They'll work very carefully to be stringent about things like that. It helps with all kinds of controls. And my little setup I've got here, I have one forest, which consists of one domain called MikeTest.local. And be honest with you, unless you're in a bigger enterprise, this is pretty common. This is pretty standard setup. All right, let's get back in there. All right, uh, hold, hold on, Network Mage. I'm, let me finish up here, and I'll answer your question. All right, so I'm do. So there's not much in here. Uh, this is just called Server Manager. Uh, this tends to run on these things almost all the time. What's interesting is for most people, they actually, for me to log, sit in front of a Windows server and type in a keyboard is extremely rare. The vast majority of the time, if I'm working on a Windows system, I'm going to be using a remote desktop or something like that because usually these servers are sitting in server rooms and I don't want to leave my chair. But in this case, even though it's a VM, we are working right at it. All right, so the other one that's kind of interesting, and this is definitely going to come into play here. Let me go ahead and you can't see it. I'll click it and get it started. And I'm going to get something called Active Directory Users and Computers. Ta-da! All right, let me just minimize this, get this out of the way. So this is where we create users for the domain and stuff like that. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want to get in. People confuse domains and Active Directory. A domain is like MikeTest.local. It's a domain. It's a DNS domain. In fact, for me to even set up this domain, I had to set up a DNS server. So it's got DNS running right on this system. Uh, so the domain allows for single sign-on because what I can do is I can create users, users that aren't sitting on the individual computers anymore. We're not going to be in a work group anymore. We're going to join the domain. In fact, I've already joined the domain with this one Windows uh, 10 system. And what will happen is now at that computer, I'm not going to log in using my local user accounts. I'm going to log in with domain accounts. And that gives me all kinds of wonderful extra features. With domain accounts, all the domain usernames and passwords are saved in a much safer place. You know, if I Instead of being on individual systems, it's over there on the uh, domain controller. I can have backup domain controllers whose only job is to support the main domain controller. If the main domain controller goes down, they automatically start working. Of course, you have to buy another copy of Windows Server, but it works. Uh, I can do roaming user profiles. So no matter where you log in on any computer in the domain, your desktop, your background, all your stuff shows up. Uh, I can set up controls uh, at the domain controller to say, you know, when do people's backups take place? I can uh, set up uh, and distribute uh, software installations across the domain or certain groups in the domain. Uh, you want to talk about going the Microsoft route? This is the kind of stuff you'd learn, okay? So that, this is just one aspect. I'm not here to necessarily sell you on domains. I'm here to sell you on NTFS, but I do want you to be aware of this. Also keep in mind, uh, NT domains were invented back in the 90s. And the only thing that the old, and this was called Windows NT back then, the only thing these domains really did was like single sign-on, you know, roaming profiles, that's been around for a while. But <clears throat> about 15 years ago, a little more than that now, uh, Microsoft's like, look, we've already got these domain controllers. They have everybody's username and password. You know, we could add a lot to this. And instead of just storing everybody's stuff, like the DNS would store its own stuff, the DHCP server would store its own stuff, the domain controller aspect, 
These are all on the same machine in this example. But in the old days, these would all be stored in their own separate databases. What they came up instead was something called a Active Directory. So an Active Directory is kind of like a super registry is about the best way to describe it. And it doesn't describe the individual computers, it describes the domain. So I can install a printer onto the domain and I can say the printer's on the third floor, it's for the accounting department and stuff like that. So uh, an Active Directory is just the type of domain services we use today. They run using the lightweight directory access protocol, LDAP. Uh, you need to know what the port number is for LDAP. I forgot what it is. Scott, somebody can save me on that one. Um, so Active Directory is how we do this stuff today. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead and take, let's go back in here. All right. So we take a look in here. You see that administrator right here? That administrator is not like a local administrator. He is uh, the administrator of the entire domain. He can do anything, anywhere, anytime, okay? So we have all of these built-in groups. Uh, we can make our own groups here. Uh, but first, what I do is I want to make our own user. So I'll just click on users, type in new, and uh, da -da, you can't see it. It's the bottom. So there's an option that says user here. So I'm going to hit here and I'm going to call it uh, uh, -da, Mike Myers. And the login name is going to be Michael M. And you'll see he'll be part of the Mike test.local. Okay. Hit next. Password. I'm typing in one of my <coughs> standard complex passwords because this Windows server I currently have it configured that you must have complicated passwords. Here it says user must change password. I'm going to uncheck that. And I'm going to say password never expires. Hit next. All right, so it's going to be Michael M. All right, so there it is. See, I've just created a new user right here. So I can also, if I want to, right click on here, click new. I can make a new group. I can call it sales. Uh, so I can make this a, uh, for only this local domain. I can make it global, which is just for my forest. Or I can do this weird thing called universal, which isn't really done much. And these are almost always what we call a, dis a security group. All right. So where do you go? This is a little frustrating. You guys can't see the bottom of that, but there is a sales there, I swear. There you go. See it? Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add Mike Myers to the sales group. So there's about a thousand different ways to do that. I'll just click on Mike Myers, right click on him, go to properties. Say he's a member of. So by default, he's a member of the domain users. So I'm going to add. Make him a member of sales. I can click on check names, verify. It underlined itself. So if I mistyped it or something, it would say no such name. And now I've made him a member of both the domain users group and the sales group. So I'm going to hit OK. And now we're all set and pretty. When you have domain users, you, you can go to any computer that's on the domain log in from there, and then the domain controller will do whatever you want it to do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to my Windows 10 system, and we're going to log in. What did I call him again? Michael M. And I remember the password. Okay. So let's head over to the other machine. We can close that for a little bit. So I'm going to log off. I'm not even sure who I'm logged in as right now. So I'm going to sign out. All right, so what I'm going to do this time is I, I have to hit control. I, I have to hit control delete to bring up the login. And you'll see it says Mike right here. That's not me, folks. That's a local user account on this system. Okay, do you understand? I want to log into the domain. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to type in uh, Oh, I got to type in a other user. There we go. All right. So right now, this, I already have this computer on the domain, so I can just type in Michael M and then the password. But if I was still on my work group, I could type in something like, uh, see, I could just type the name of the computer and then my name, Mike, I could log in locally, or I could just type in Mike test here. So what I'm going to do, it's already Mike test. So I'm just going to do Michael M. I don't even have to do anything other than that because it's assuming it's mic test. Type in the password. This better work. I'm coming in cold, people. Yay! So I'm going to give him a minute to set up the desktop. You have to understand, this drives people crazy because like they've got a, like the first time they do this and they just have a work group running because they don't have a domain controller and they've been logging in with like, I use mic all the time. So you log in as Mike, right? Well, now you got a domain controller. So now you run over to the domain controller, you create a new user, right? In my case, I called it Michael M. And the first time you log in, you got a new desktop. It's because you logged in as a different user. You're not logging in locally into this system. You're logging into the domain. Let me show you. Hey, it's a blank desktop. That's right, because I've never logged into this guy before. But if we take a look and I go into the C drive. I'm hoping you guys can see this. And I go down to users. In fact, I'm going to make this bigger so I, I, I want you guys to be able to see this. There we go. So here in my users, see I'm in the users folder. So there was, these were the other ones I had, Mike and Fred, but you'll see this Michael M. That's there because I logged into this computer for the first time. A complete new user profile has been built for this guy. So that's pretty much how this works. Now, what's very cool now is that I can go to any computer on the network. I can do it on the server. I can do it on any other computer. And I can start making shares. And by default, because it's joined the domain, when I say who I'm going to share it with, it's not going to be with local users. It's going to ignore those other names. What it's going to do instead, it's going to go to the domain. And all the domain names that I have up there, that's how we set up the shares. Well, Mike, what do I do with my local accounts? Most of the time, the first time, once you start logging into a domain, about the only time you'll ever use your local user accounts anymore is like if you're changing hardware. That's about the only time you would log off the domain, you'd log in locally, you know, add new hard drives, uh, stuff like that. Uh, you don't use the local users. But this is what gets people in trouble. When I have machines join a domain, I will have one local user account on all those computers. And it's going to be the administrator, the local administrator account. Here's an A-plus question for you. So if you want to change like a video card, the right way to do it is you log off the domain, you log in as a local administrator, do whatever you want to do, get it up and running good, reboot or log off, and then log back into the domain. That is Microsoft best practices for this type of stuff. So um, make sure you're comfortable with that. That also means that somebody better know what the username and password is for a local administrator on every single computer in the office. It's also a pretty good Achilles heel for me to sneak in onto systems. Most offices will have a local user account that's called administrator. That'll be an active account. And in a lot of offices, they use the exact same password on every computer. So that would be, if there'd be a way for me to figure out a password and I could log in locally, I own the network. I need you to be comfortable with the concept if you own a Windows machine, either you're on a domain or you're in a work group. Work groups have almost no security to them whatsoever. About the only thing that'll happen is when you go into network, you'll see the other computers in your network. Like here in my office, we have, uh, here in my house, I use a work group called work group. I don't have any need for a domain controller. I'm just setting this up for you guys to be able to see it. For years, 
Microsoft had an alternative that was kind of between a work group and a domain called a home group. Home groups gave a pretty good amount of security without a lot of work. Uh, home groups are definitely on CompTIA exams, in particular the A+, and probably the Network+. Plus. So home groups work in a very different way. You start with a work group, you have one computer, you go into the control panel, you say, I want a home group, and then all the other computers will automatically see the home group and ask you if you want to join them. With home groups, all you do is you share your libraries. Uh, my music, my documents, that kind of thing. Home groups are wonderful. They run only on IPv6. And last month, you guys ready for this? Last month, Microsoft deprecated them. There is no more home group. And to make it worse, if you upgrade to the latest version of Windows 10, what is it, 2004? Windows 10 version 2004, home groups disappear. They just, poof, go away. This is a big problem for a lot of us who are studying for CompTIA A+, and Net+, because we need to know about home groups, but if you own Windows 10 and you upgrade it, all the home groups will disappear. And by the way, you have to upgrade it. You can delay an upgrade, but you can't stop an upgrade. So to that end, I'm going to ask my buddy James Stranger from CompTIA. He's going to be joining us on a Zoom meeting, I'm hoping next week. And we're going to talk to him about some questions like that. Don't worry about home group for the existing test. Make sure you understand a home group, it's, it's different than a work group, it's different than a domain. You start with a work group, one computer creates the home group. There was a control panel applet called home groups. Uh, once it makes that home group, all the other computers in your network will automatically see it and you, all you have to do is go to your home group and join it and you're all hooked in together. Uh, what home groups make uh, sharing libraries trivial. Uh, it, it works beautifully. And to be honest with you, I don't know why Microsoft got rid of it. I know a lot of people who use home groups. And I'll be curious to see what happens to those of us who actually have a functioning home group and you upgrade all your systems to Windows 10 2004. Is it going to erase the home groups? Because when I went from, uh, when I upgraded 2404, the version before, I still had a few home group settings left. In fact, if you guys saw them uh, last week, they were still there. Well, they're gone now. Craziness, huh? We'll see what happens. I'm assuming that's Scott Jernigan hitting me there. Scott, were you going to do NTFS shares in a domain and show all those? Sure. Okay, so let's go ahead and do one more cool thing. Uh, let's go back to the Windows 10 system that's now a member of the domain, and let's go ahead and share something, and we'll see that it looks quite a bit different than if we're just sharing something in a work group. Okay, so, so I'm just going to go on my desktop here. I'm going to make a new folder. Call it Timmy. All right, so I got this folder on Timmy, and I want to share this with uh, somebody on the domain. Now, you start with the same process we did on Friday, all right? You say you give access to, and what we're going to do is we're going to say specific people. And what we do is we hit this pull down, and we can give it to everyone, or we can hit on find people. When we did this last week, we actually had a list of all the other local user accounts appear, but because we're not on local user accounts, we, d we don't see that. So we're going to click on Find People. And here's the st stinky part. So here it says Mike Test Local. So we're, we're local, but I have to pick somebody who's actually a user. And I think I have a guy called Fred. I hope so. Yes, I created a user called Fred Flintstone. Do you see that? He just showed up. You got to be really careful about, like for example, when you make a bunch of users on a domain, you need to stick with really careful convention. So like uh, Michael M, Scott J, Kathy Y, 
or you can do M. Myers, S. Jernigan. You have to s create and stick to a specific format, scott.jernigan at totaltest.local. Uh, because if you don't do that, nobody's going to know how to share stuff. <laughs> because especially you got 4,000 people on a domain. I was lucky that I remembered Fred. And I just made these two accounts out of the blue. All right. So I'm going to hit OK. And I'm going to share it. Now, before it allows me to share it, it's like, wait, 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 wait. You need, uh, you need an administrator username and password. And the share took place. So wait a minute, Mike, you're telling me and for me to share anything, I have to have an administrator password? No, what administ you can create subgroups like super user groups that can uh, have control on shares or you can set certain people up in the sales group to only have their ability to share. You can set up different parts of your directory tree that you can share. Like if you notice, I could have shared that with everyone and by the way, that wouldn't have shown up. So you have some wonderful granular controls. These are things that Microsoft administrators do, okay? Um, it, this is all part of NTFS. Uh, it, NTFS doesn't care if it's a local user account or a domain account. As long as it's got the name and the password and what you're allowed to do, all those, uh, here, the, here, let me show you so you know I'm not a liar. So, All the NTFS permissions are still there, just like we saw last week, except now we're doing it with users that are uh, not local accounts. These are domain accounts. And yes, you can still see administrators have full control in here as well. Okay. All the rules that we learned last week about this stuff is the same. If you're on, in a work group and you have an individual computer, and let's say you create two groups on that, uh, sales and engineering, the NTFS permissions are combined. So if you give Bob full control in one group and read only in another group, that's all, he'll get full control. That's another CompTIA question there is, you know, you, you add up all the permissions from all the group memberships and that's what they're, uh, there's a special term for it some nation of their controls comes into play. And that's the same thing with domain groups. It's like we made that sales group. And so Fred Flintstone is just a member of the domain users, but that Mike Myers account we made is a member of both domain users and sales. And if we have different permissions, it all adds up together and it's cumulative. So you might remember that one. Okay. Oh, we only got about five minutes left. All right, so if there's any questions, I'm going to have to save those. But uh, that, that's the basic gist of what we're going to be running into. Um, I didn't see. I'm, I'm just looking for mess, uh, questions since I kind of ran through. We got a few more. Yeah, don't hire anyone else named Mike, that's for sure. No questions. All right, guys, did, did I just teach you anything? Was that good information? Please text, type something in the live chat and say, is this good or bad? There's no questions. Okay. Okay, I wasn't sure. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Tolowit. I, I always worry when nobody asks questions. I'm like, am I boring you guys to death? Listen, you can set all this up yourself. Just get, go ahead and get a copy of Virtual PC and then go get some ISOs. Go get a Windows Server ISO. Go get a Windows 10 ISO from Microsoft. They're only 90 days long, but that's plenty of practice time. Set all this stuff up yourself. It's a lot of fun. All right. Oh, here we go. Okay, 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 okay. I don't see any more questions. Uh, 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 uh. 
Azads, you'll be able to find home groups if you right click and try to share something. I believe, and the, I think the only time you'll see home groups there is if you already had an existing home group on your network. Okay, well, if Holly Jackson liked it, well, then I know we're okay. Amiga. Uh, is Timmy from South Park? No, 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 Kim, I do. Uh, I use Timmy as my throwaway accounts because everybody else uses temp, right? So I always hate coming in to see a big list of things and there's like a temp folder and a temp user and a temp access control list on a router because uh, I'm afraid to delete them. If you ever, ever work with me in a network and you see anything called Timmy, you know that it's A, it's temporary, and B, feel free to delete it at any time. That's just a Mike Myers thing. I started doing it a long time ago. All right. Well, I think we're in good shape. Is there, I, was everybody happy? <clears throat> I think everybody was happy with the hashing. Um, we should probably do HMAC. I'm going to remind myself. Okay, so we just got a couple of minutes left. So for Wednesday, we're going to be doing uh, uh, AAA, which is Radius and Takakis. And really, that's just more talking. Uh, you're not expected to know much. In fact, we already talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but we can talk about it again. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we'll do a thing on resumes. Uh, we got a I do have a couple of resumes from some folks, and uh, so I'll put a big circle around that. And we're going to be talking about people's resumes. Again, I'm not a resume expert, but I'm going to give you my opinions of things that I look for in resumes. Things are going to speak to me. Um, and we have a, a couple of folks have kindly volunteered their own resumes and uh, we'll be taking a look at those. I'll, I'll hide your phone numbers and addresses, guys. And uh, I'm kind of tempted maybe do a little bit more on hashing. We had a good start today, but hashes get a lot more interesting when you see them working for a living. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to obligate myself to anything. I'm thinking about teaching you guys TLS four-way handshake to see how secure web page. Oh, I can't do that. That would really. <sighs> so I guess certificates are coming, aren't they? Certificates are fascinating. And, and once you understand how they work, you're like, duh. But uh, we'll, we'll save that one. We'll save that. We'll see how things go. Um, cool. Uh, oh, good. And yes. Remember, just because you guys were kind enough to show up, we got 60% off. This is ridiculous. These prices are insane. 60% uh, off all of our practice questions and simulations. Uh, Scott Jernigan has that information in there, right in the uh, live chat. All you have to go, do is go to www.totalsem.com. Go to our store, pick out the practice questions you want, simulations you want, and then you just type in the code, uh, MM Live Fireworks. Uh, also, we have bundles for videos and, and stuff like that. I know a lot of you guys are not using L Linda or, or Udemy, uh, and we also have them through ourselves. And uh, just contact Kathy Y at totalsim.com. Um, I am not against, if you want to think about uh, more on the domains and NTFS, I, there's a lot more I could talk about but without anybody asking questions, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it to your own matter of personal interest. And always remember, you can contact me uh, through my email address, and I'll be more than glad if you've got a detailed question. Just uh, shoot me an email, and we'll talk about it then. So, But other than that, I think it's once again 4 o'clock. And time for me to be doing... It's interesting, I'm actually working on Security Plus right now, and I'm going to be doing... Triple A. I'm going to be doing some Radius and Takaka stuff. So that'll be kind of fun. But until then, uh, we will be back next Wednesday at 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time here in the United States of America. So whatever the time that is on your neck of the globe, I really appreciate you guys. I know some of you guys, it's like 1 o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much for your dedication. I appreciate it. 
And, uh, but until then, I will see you guys next Wednesday. So after that, this is your Uncle Mikey saying good night. Good night.